Pell in Kensington <clears throat> near the Natural History Museum. The Natural History Museum plays a very important role in uh, uh, Darwin's ideas and concepts and his science. Uh, it's the place when he was traveling around the world, it's the place where he would send back all of his samples, his fossil collections, his beetle collections, stuff that he had accumulated on the voyage. He would ship every now and then back and scientists at the museum would uh, parcel it out or examine it and, and um, try to make sense out of it. So it was a very important um, part of Darwin's life and his and, and the history. I believe this has just gone off, right? Yeah. <clears throat> um, and he, here's the statue of Darwin that's, being, that's unveiled in uh, 1885. I remember Darwin died only three years earlier. The museum wanted to have a statue of Charles Darwin, so they solicited donations from all around the world. And the money literally poured in from individuals all around the world. They collected two or three times as much money as they needed. The statue, um, the statue which was sculpted um, cost twenty-one hundred dollars, twenty-one hundred pounds, sorry. This is going to be very annoying. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, and they raised a lot more money and they used the rest of the money to support uh, uh, <coughs> research. What's interesting is that the crowds of people who were there at the unveiling of the statue. This was three years after Darwin's death. He'd been buried, as we'll see, in Westminster Abbey. Um, he was at one of the heights of his uh, uh, popularity at, at, at the time. He was a national hero. That's why they were able to raise the money, and that's why they were able to build the statue, and it was going to be placed in the Natural History Museum. I think the battery might be off, so sorry guys. Stationary. Let's try again. Now, can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> Is this working? Okay. All right. So I better speak right into it. Okay. <clears throat> um, so the statue was placed at a, in a place of honor in the, um, in, in, the, in the main lobby on the giant staircase leading up to the second floor. So as you walk in, you would have seen it prominently displayed. But in 1927, <clears throat> it was moved for an elephant exhibit. And it was relegated to what was called the North Hall, which is actually under the stairs. And it became the cafeteria. <clears throat> so here's where I saw this statue of Charles Darwin when I visited in 2006. <clears throat> it's not a very <coughs> prominent location. It's actually, it's a little bit embarrassing. People are sitting around tables um, eating. Uh, and that's a reflection, I think, of the times. <coughs> By the 1920s, Darwin wasn't quite as much of a hero as he had been in 1985, in 1885, and there was somewhat of an eclipse of Darwinism or natural selection. <laughs> Many scientists in the 1920s weren't even sure that natural selection was, was a workable uh, hypothesis. <clears throat> However, last year, the museum decided that they better rectify this situation so they moved the statue. You can go to the website and you actually can see it being moved. Here it is, <laughs> being moved up the, back up the staircases to the place of honor at the top of the stairs now as you see it as you come in. Now, of course, they were aware of the fact that there would be Darwin celebrations in, in 2009. Um, and it would be too embarrassing to have to you know, go to the cafeteria to see the statue of Darwin. But it's also an indication of the change in thinking about him. Now he's been sort of re-examined uh, as a national hero, and so this year there are 
coins with Darwin's pictures on it, there are stamps with Darwin's pictures on it, the statue is back where it belongs, and everybody is celebrating Darwin. <coughs> Except the United States was Lincoln, <coughs> who's being celebrated today. But, uh, so he's been reinstated uh, very much in a place of honor, both physically by moving the statue uh, and uh, emotionally. Now, after we had visited the Natural History Museum and seen the sites and seen all the collections and, and whatnot and, and had lunch beside Charles, uh, the next day we took a train from Victoria Station to uh, southeast of London, well into the Kent countryside, to a little town called Down, and we visited Charles' house, Charles Darwin's house, Down House. So here I am on the left <coughs> with my friend. Um, some of you may recognize him. This is P.Z. Myers, who was here last fall giving a talk. <coughs> and he has a blog that some people can visit from time to time. <coughs> it's actually his talk is 50,000 people a day. <coughs> uh, visit for <coughs> uh, So we visited and checked out uh, <coughs> Down House. There's Darwin's study on the left, preserved pretty much as it was when Darwin worked there. This is where he lived for... 40 years. This is where he, he wrote Origin of Species. He did much of his thinking. He actually didn't leave the house all that much um, in the last, uh, for the last half of his, uh, of his lifetime. Now, I was interested, of course, in the, in the inside, which is, which is fascinating. Uh, but I was also very much interested in the outside. So here's a Google Earth image of, uh, of, of Darwin's house uh, showing up in the upper right hand corner of this image is the house itself, that elongated white uh, structure up here. Okay? Uh, and there are gardens down here. And here's the greenhouse. And there are more gardens uh, along this uh, um, uh, pathway down to the, to the back <coughs> 40, so to speak. Darwin did a lot of experiments with plants, with earthworms, and with insects. The sound is going down. Uh, this, this was his laboratory. This was where he did an awful lot of the work that led to many of his publications, including Origin of Species, where if you read it, you'll see there are lots of experiments in there where he tests various things. This is where it all happened. So I was really anxious to see uh, the outside. In fact, here I am in the greenhouse uh, looking at all these plants, some of which are direct descendants of plants uh, that, that, that Darwin brought there from either his own collections or more likely seeds that were sent to him from others all around the, uh, the world. So he kept his groundskeeper quite busy uh, planting and, um, and experimenting uh, while he was at the uh, downhouse. I was also very interested, there's a, there's a path, of course, that leads down from, from the house down here to the back uh, part of the lot, and the path leads along here and circles around in this little forest. This path is called the sand walk. This is where Darwin used to walk every day. It's where he did a lot of his thinking. It's where he composed a lot of his letters. He, was a, he, he had a, a, a huge network. He would, love, he would have been a blogger. <laughs> he had a huge network of correspondence. He corresponded with people all over the world. Um, <clears throat> I, I forget the, the, the exact number, but something on the order of 60 or 70% of all the mail that ever came to down the village was to Charles Darwin, so that we're talking, you know, <clears throat> dozens and dozens of letters uh, every day. It wasn't a big town. This is really mm -hmm. a small place. So this was the sand walk where, where Darwin used to walk. And I don't know, I'm not a Darwin worshiper, but I still found it quite <laughs> thrilling <laughs> to walk on the sand walk where, <clears throat> and it was then that I just I made my blog, Sand Walk, uh, <clears throat> after, having, after having visited it. So uh, PZ and I went back to, <coughs> to London to our hotel, and, 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 and another day we went to Westminster Abbey to see where Darwin <coughs> is buried. And here's a picture of Darwin's tomb in Westminster Abbey. It's in the floor 